Hello scouts, uh, Greg Muller here again. We're gonna go ahead and start with our search and rescue merit badge. Um, this merit badge, much like the first aid merit badge and uh, wilderness survival merit badge is a lot of classroom, so it's gonna be a lot of um, you listening to me talk and kind of follow along in your book here and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Go ahead and start off on page seven here. What is search and rescue? Imagine the concern a parent or loved one has when a teenager is overdue from a hike in the wilderness. A small child is missing from a crowded playground a rock climber becomes stranded on a precarious ledge, or an elderly person wanders away from a caregiver. These occurrences happen several hundred times each year and often require services of trained search and rescue, SAR for search and rescue for short, managers and teams. While many people are able to self-evacuate from remote areas thanks to advanced advances in technology such as cell phones, GPS, uh, which stands for Global Positioning System, and uh, personal locator devices, but people still get injured and lost. As a bit of a, a warning here, but, uh, be aware that earning the Search and Rescue Merit Badge will not qualify you as a trained searcher. You should never attempt a search or rescue on your own. If you find you're confronted with a missing person situation, remain calm and immediately report the situation to a scout leader, parent, or responsible adult. If these people are not immediately available, dial 911. Search and rescue mission is much like solving a mystery. Once a person called the subject is reported missing, law enforcement officials activate search teams. The following procedures then take place. Uh, first off, an incident commander is appointed to run the search and rescue operation using what is called the incident command system. And we're going to be going over that, the ICS, incident command system. Step two here, an incident action plan, IAP is developed to guide the searchers as they look for the subject. The incident commander and his or her staff decide which kind of teams to deploy. These could be ground, horse, dog, ATV, snowmobile, mountain bike, or even aircraft teams. Teams are deployed to search for the subject using a variety of search and rescue skills. If all goes well, the subject is located and returned to safety. Uh, as we go over this and work on this merit badge, you will learn and practice many skills that will help someday save a life. Uh, a lot of these practical skills, I'm gonna go over how to do them and you guys are gonna have to do them on your own and uh, submit that into our um, virtual camps at winnebago.com email. Uh, as you guys complete these, then I will check them off your requirements and get you a blue card sent out or filled out for you. So, uh, What is search and what is rescue? A search is an emergency situation requiring a team of trained searchers to locate a missing person. The search may be brief and simple, such as finding a missing child who is sleeping in his parents' car, or it might involve hundreds of searchers and days of coordinated, well-managed activity. A rescue is an emergency situation where a person's location is known, uh, perhaps they have just been found by searchers and he or she must be removed from danger and returned to safety. Uh, this could involve just walking out with them, uh, but a lot of times this will require um, like an aircraft or ATV or something along those lines. Uh, this the term search and rescue is used because rescues are often required after the person is found. Frequently the same person are trained to do both functions, search for the subject and then treat and remove the subject. Who does search and rescue? So a couple of the main uh, search and rescue teams are uh, volunteers, um, but they may be with the Forest Service, Coast Guard, or fire and rescue workers, or members of other agencies. Staff members at scouting high adventure bases, including Philmont Scout Ranch, are also trained in search and rescue. You guys can review a couple of those other agencies that are allowed there. The National Association for Search and Rescue is a nonprofit organization that promotes development and improved coordination among all search and rescue resources. Uh, NASAR, NASAR is the National Association for Search and Rescue, offers training and certification functions to help teams worldwide better be pre better prepared to do search and rescue. Uh, how to contact a SAR team, a computer search or cell phone call to your local police, sheriff or state police. 911 is always going to be your best bet. The governors of each state decide which state or local agency has responsibility for search and rescue activities within their borders. The MRA, the Mountain Rescue Association, National Ski Patrol, dive teams, cave rescue groups, and four-wheel drive clubs all stand ready to assist with search and rescue as well. All right, we're going to start talking about the incident command system here, the world of SAR on page 13. Uh, search and rescue, much like scouting, has its own unique language. In order to understand search and rescue, it's necessary to know some of the most common terminology and how SAR operations are structured. The Incident Command System, ICS, is a systematic approach to the management of emergency incidents using, uh, used by fire departments, emergency medical services, law enforcement agencies, and search and rescue teams to manage all types of emergencies. This, flex this system is flexible and scalable to all types and sizes of incidents and events. ICS is the most effective, efficient, and economical system to manage search and rescue missions. The history there of the ICS is wildland firefighters first used it in the 70s for management of large wildland fires. 
In the 80s, the National Fire Protection Association began requiring that the ICS be used to manage all large fires and emergency, emergency medical incidents. In 2003, Homeland Security Presidential Directive 5 mandated that all federal agents agencies use ICS to manage all incidences. Uh, the key concepts for ICS it uses five key concepts. Uh, unity of command is the first one. Unity of command refers to the concept that each person or resource responding to a scene reports to only one supervisor. This eliminates the potential for individuals to receive conflicting orders from multiple supervisors. Uh, unity of command increases accountability, prevents resources from working without the knowledge of command, improves the flow of information, enhances operational safety. This, con this concept is fundamental to the ICS chain of command structure. Uh, common terminology. So that's uh, in the past individual agencies or teams have their own terminology. Part of the ICS that makes it so effective is that everybody knows what all these acronyms and, and search terms and, and such are used for. Management by objective. Incidents are managed by setting and working towards specific objectives. Objectives should be ranked by priority as specific as possible, attainable, and if possible, given a working time frame. Objectives are accomplished by first outlining strategies, general plans of actions, and then determining appropriate tactics, uh, which is how the strategy will be executed for, uh, for a chosen strategy. Flexible and modular organization. ICS is organized so that it can grow or shrink as the incident dictates. Command is established from the top down with the most important positions, such as incident commander, established first, only those positions that are required need to be filled. Most incidents will require that only a few positions be filled. However, as incidents grow, grows and more resources are required, more positions may be added. And lastly, the span of control. The concept of manageable span of control limits the number of resources and responsibilities that are managed by a single supervisor. The ICS requires that any single person's span of control should be from three to seven individuals with an optimal number of five, but no more than seven. If more than seven resources are being managed by an individual, the command structure needs to be expanded by adding a new command position. Good management in search and rescue requires capable people knowing what to do at all levels, each with a clear picture of the incident command structure. This is why everyone involved in a search and rescue operation must, ha must have basic knowledge of the incident command system. Everyone must know his or her position within the overall structure and must understand the terms and functional titles used. After all, what good does it do to call a person an incident commander if no one really knows what that means? So moving on to the different incident command positions. For incident command system, the, we are fulfilling uh, requirement number five here. So it says we can use any combination of resource materials such as printed or online, but uh, hopefully you guys all have this merit badge book. This has got everything in it you need. ICS positions is organized by levels with the supervisor of each level holding a specific title. The incident commander provides overall leadership for the incident response and delegates authority to others in his or her command. The incident commander performs all command responsibilities until he or she is, assigns people to those positions, establishes the incident objectives, and directs the development of the incident action plan, uh, which is a set of documents that call for details about the search and rescue. The incident commander typically is train, uh, has training and certification as well as experience in multiple positions within the ICS. There are three types of incident command. Single incident command, uh, and this is the most common type of incident command, is a single individual is designed as the incident commander and has sole responsibility for the incident. Unified command is often used for larger incidents when multiple agencies are involved. A unified command usually has one representative from each agency involved and they work together. So if you have uh, firefighters, search and rescue teams, search and rescue dogs, you got you know, you might have uh, FBI or any other, uh, you know, Homeland Security or any of these other agencies all working together. So they'll generally assign one person to a, a, like a team or a committee to, to have a unified command. Area command is during multiple incident situations such as a large wildfire or natural disaster. An area command may be established. The area commanders provide for an incident command at separate locations. In this case, they typically manage resources and do not establish objectives or develop incident action plans. A briefing is a meeting in which information is provided on what to do or what to expect ahead of time and a debriefing is a meeting in which the search team is questioned about its success or problems or difficulties encountered during a search. So those are a couple of more terms there that are important to remember. Uh, only in very large and complex incidents would all the ICS positions be staffed. As the incident scales down the ICS positions will be eliminated until there's only an incident commander. So that's what we talk about the system being flexible that it expands and contracts in size uh, as needed for the for the situation at hand. Command staff. 
An incident command system enables integrated communication and planning by establishing a managed span of control. An ICS divides an emergency response into five manageable functions essential for emergency response operations. Command, operations, planning, logistics, and finance and administration. There's a chart here that uh, shows the hierarchy there within the command system structure on page 17. Uh, the command staff consists of the safety officer, public information officer, and liaison officer. These officers report directly to the incident commander and may have assistance in major incidents. Uh, the safety officer monitors the safety of all the responders and bystanders and gives safety messages at planning meetings and briefings. The public information officer provides information to the public. The liaison ser officer serves as a primary contact for supporting agencies involved in the incident. General staff is made up of operations, planning, logistics, and finance administration section chiefs. The operations section chief is tasked with determining tactics and supervising resources to meet the incident objectives. Planning section chief. The planning section chief is responsible for collecting, evaluating, and disseminating incident information, developing and documenting, documenting the IAP, and leading the planning meeting. Logistics section chief provides facility services and material support. Finance and slash administration section chief is tasked with all the administrative and financial considerations surrounding an incident. Uh, this is the least used section. The planning meeting's main purpose is to develop the incident action plan for the next operational period. Most planning meetings last less than 30 minutes. The first piece of information that we try to get here is the place last seen or the last known point. Uh, while those terms are similar, they have slightly different meanings. The place last seen is someone who can positively identify the subject actually saw the subject. Last known point could be the same as the, the place last seen, but it may also be where the subject was known to have been, but not necessarily seen. The subject's abandoned vehicle, a logbook at the trailhead, a photo taken at an ATM machine or by a security camera, or some other form of positive physical evidence can help establish the last known point. All right, moving on to our IAP, our Incident Action Plan and Mission Objectives. Uh, now that you understand the incident command system is used in both small and large emergencies, it is necessary to know why careful planning is done at the very beginning of the mission. Uh, even as the IAP, or Incident Action Plan, is being developed, it is vital to confirm the uh, confinement and search area and deploy some quick responses such as a hasty team. We will define the terms uh, hasty team and hasty search later on in the book here. So, uh, Search and rescue objectives. Search and rescue incidents are usually managed using the incident command system. This system uses a technique called management by objectives which involves determining your next action by developing objectives that must be obtainable, measurable, and flexible. An example objective might be search for missing subject from trailhead to top of the ridge. Uh, would this objective be ob obtainable, measurable, and flexible? Notice that no search resources were part of this objective. As you might use more than one search resource to complete this objective, a ground, like a ground team and a helicopter, the kinds of resources used are very rarely identified as part of the objective. Uh, a hasty team is the first team deployed during a search. Its job is to look quickly and accurately for clues that may lead to this, the team members to the subject. This quick search is called a hasty search. A good way to look at an objective is to ask, what do you want done? Strategies answer the question, how do you want to, how do you want it done? And task assignments answer, who do you want to do it? Search resources are used to meet objectives. There may be many objectives during a search or rescue incident. However, even in major disasters, there are usually fewer than 10 objectives at any particular time. Objectives are developed for a specific time period called the operational period. Most operational periods are 12 hours long, though they can be any length that the incident commander orders. For instance, in the above scenario, one objective could be check all campgrounds within three miles of the hunting camp every three hours until the subject is located, or search incident is suspended. This objective covers multiple time periods and would be an incident long objectives. All right, your IAP. Now that we understand the objectives and operational time periods, you can add other tasks and information needed to manage the next operational period. This plan is referred to as the Incident Action Plan. So there is a couple of examples of forms here. The IAP consists of eight forms, which are available at this website here on page 22. For our scenario that we're going to run through and you guys will turn in, you can print those off and we will work from a specific uh, example from the book here in a little bit. Uh, some parts of the Incident Action Plan might not be needed. For example, a traffic plan would only be used if you need to reroute vehicle traffic to avoid congestion at the SAR incident base. The IAP may also include incident map, traffic plan, and subject information. 
Other pieces of information that might be important to document the next operational time period can also be included. The ICS planning session is responsible for putting this plan together. When completed, the plan is presented at a command and general staff meeting called the planning meeting. This meeting is normally held during the middle of the current operational time period. The purpose of this meeting is to review the current period objectives and put together a plan of action for the next operational period. The meeting has an agenda and is chaired by the planning section chief, like we talked about a little bit ago. All elements of the IAP are discussed and modified as needed. The incident commander must approve the plan before it can be implemented. The key is finding information that would be used to help develop the IAP and completing the relevant forms. So if you follow along in these forms, they're going to help you map out all the, all the steps you need here. Uh, you might not have enough information to fill out any one form completely, while some information should be duplicated on every form, like the name of the incident, the next operational time period, date, and time. To fulfill requirement 8, you may use any of the practice scenarios presented in this pamphlet. Uh, like I mentioned, if you prefer, your merit badge counselor might also create one for you. Uh, we're just going to use one right out of your merit badge book. Search and rescue, like any other skill, is best learned by practice. For this merit badge, you will not have a real subject to search for, therefore you and your patrol or troop should test the skills you have learned by doing practice search activities. Um, I understand a lot of people around the country are a lot of uh, troops are not uh, meeting, so any of this stuff that you need to fulfill the requirements, um, feel free to use your family, your brothers, sisters, parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, neighbors, whoever you can get to help you. Uh, a lot of the requirements are going to say as a troop or as a patrol to complete something, but um, we understand that that's not always possible right now, so feel free to use your family. So for practice scenario one, starting on page 26. It is noon. You are assigned to the planning section and are asked to prepare for the planning meeting to be held at 2 p.m. The information available so far is the following. A scout from Troop 1792 is missing. John Lopez, age 14, was last seen yesterday about noon when his patrol stopped for lunch on the Bear Canyon Trail at Philmont. He was not feeling well, though, and thought he had eaten something that upset his stomach. He has a history of stomach trouble and has medication that controls it. However, he did not bring it with him yesterday. When found, he might need medical attention. The closest ambulance is located in Cimarron and can be contacted at this number if needed. Uh, for this practice scenario, you might use the following. Uh, for the objective, search from Campground Road to Silver Lake. Strategy, use a canine dog team and aircraft. Task assignment, K9 Team 4, Civil Air Patrol Aircraft. The scout master, who is a trained incident commander, has named the search Bear Canyon Search, and the incident commander has put together the following objectives for today's search actions. Ensure the safety of all scouts on the search. Search Bear Canyon Trail from the last place seen to the old log cabin. Notify all campers at the campground within three miles of the place last seen of the missing scout. Ensure good radio communication cover for the entire search area. So you see here is if you just follow along in these formats that we use for the uh, uh, incident action plan. If you just kind of follow along and just map everything out as you, it, the information comes available to you on these, on these forms that you can get at that website, uh, you can see it. A lot of this information can seem pretty daunting and kind of overwhelming to try to learn all at once, but as long as you're filling out these forms, it'll help you guide along the way the information that you need. So, The incident commander, Bill Johnson, said he would stay on as the incident commander during the next operational period. Rhonda Jackson is the operations section chief. Ben Sakamoto is planning section chief. Charlene Greer will stay with the family as liaison officer, and Bob Reel is the logistics chief. Again, it's all on these forms. Uh, the hierarchy and the structure of your uh, incident organization chart. And for these, you know, we're just using uh, practice scenarios here. Obviously, you guys aren't going to have a missing person, so. The operations section chief has requested that all searchers in the field use the local sheriff's radio on channel 4. Logistics have requested its section use channel 2. The sheriff's department has advised the incident commander that their radio network will cover the entire search area. So that if, uh, fulfills number 4 here on the objectives. Make sure that there's good radio coverage. It has been reported that bears may be in the search area and all searchers should be notified to be alert for the signs of bears. Weather in the search area tonight should be very cold. Temperatures may drop to 25 degrees and winds are predicted to be from the north at 15 miles per hour with gusts to 25 until dawn. The planning section is preparing posters advising all participants of the possibilities of bears in the search area as well as predicted cold weather. The operations section chief has requested that K9 Team 4 search the Bear Canyon Trail tonight. She will advise the team to be aware of any signs of bears. The K-9 team will need to be transported from the log cabin back to the incident base. 
She has also requested that one of the sheriff's vehicles check all campgrounds within three miles of the place last seen every four hours tonight, as well as interview all campers about the missing scout and tell them to call 911 if they see him. So that's our first uh, practice scenario there. I'm going to take a short break here and then we're going to start off with the search and rescue environments that are unique, including urban, water, snow, that kind of thing. So take a quick break here and that'll get us to practice uh, scenario two once we talk about the special search and rescue environments. All right, we're back with the special search and rescue environments on page 29. Urban SAR. An urban search involves looking for a subject in a populated area as opposed to a wilderness setting. Uh, in addition to basic SAR principles, searchers working in an urban environment must also know how to use equipment suited to the situation, be aware of safety concerns relating to traffic and other hazards, and understand subject behavior as it applies to an urban environment. In this case, it's usually a small child or elderly person, um, sometimes elderly people with Alzheimer's get confused and will walk away from their care facility or home. Type 1 urban search. Urban SAR teams work in cities, suburbs, and even rural areas. The type 1 urban search is likely a hasty search, but emphasizes notification of nearby residents and quick searches of areas open to the public. At times, a search may originate in an urban area and quickly move to a less populated neighborhood or even the wilderness. An example of this might be if the last known point is near the edge of town. The teams must always understand that the search may be related to a crime against the subject, such as an abduction. Searches in urban areas are most effective when conducted at times when residents are at home and can be alerted. Often neighbors have information about the subject that can be useful. Being able to hand out flyers and photos is also good. When searching a neighborhood, search teams ask residents if or any members of their family has seen or know the subject. They are requested to search their own yards and outbuildings or other places where a subject may seek shelter out on their property. Um, here locally in Iowa, we just had a, uh, an older gentleman that has uh, Alzheimer's or dementia wander away. And he was out for four days, and that was one of the big things that they put out was search your unlocked vehicles, search your outbuildings, search any of your sheds, anything like that. Um, so a lot of times if somebody's looking for shelter, they can shelter up in your building. So searchers also ask about any known trails or possible places in the area where the subject could seek shelter. Sometimes children know more about trails than adults because they're using them on their bikes and walking as opposed to driving. Parks, beaches, schoolyards, urban trails, trash bins, and open public buildings should be quickly searched. The team scribe or note taker will record information about who has been contacted in their address, the public areas that have been checked, and where additional SAR efforts might be needed. Uh, just like in your patrol method, there's a scribe. If the searchers find the person or something that might help in the search, they should log the information and communicate via phone or radio with the SAR team base. Any areas that might have a safety concern or might be occupied by a suspicious person must be searched by law enforcement personnel. Type 2 urban search is a systematic search of yards and buildings and all the places within the assigned area. The interview and introduction as in type 1, except that the team members will seek permission to do the search themselves. If a residence is the last known place, it must be searched by highly trained search searchers. The landowner or a representative should be present at all time. This type of search and rescue is generally used within one quarter mile of the place last seen or last known point. Type 3 urban search is not used very often, but it may be necessary in instances where a very thorough search is needed to cover an area. This is similar to how and when search and rescue would be conducted in a wilderness setting. As this search becomes more complicated, be aware that the incident might be leaning towards the commission of a crime. Additional personnel who have advanced skills and a positive mental attitude are very clue aware and are able to fully document their actions and writings will be used. Areas that are woody, brushy, or have high grasses may have to be grid searched using, uh, utilizing wilderness tactics. It's a warm day here in Iowa, so I might uh, be moving this indoors here at some point if it gets too windy or too warm for me. So, All right, a water rescue. On an average day, the U.S. Coast Guard responds to 64 search and rescue cases and assists 117 people in distress. So that's quite a bit more than you would think about, but it's a big country. Search and rescue is one of the Coast Guard's oldest missions, uh, preventing and minimizing the loss of life, injury, or property damage, or loss by rendering aid to people in distress in a maritime environment has always been a Coast Guard priority. The Coast Guard monitors distress, uh, like Mayday signals, and responds on the waters in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, the Gulf of Mexico, and several inland waterways. The Coast Guard responds to a search and rescue situation using cutters, small patrol boats, motor surf boats, and aircraft, both 
fixed wing and helicopters. They are all linked by a very high-tech communications network, and the Coast Guard also provides maritime safety program, including recreational boating safety and commercial vessel safety. All families should have a list of emergency numbers posted near their phone. If you live near a large body of water, you should include the phone number of the US, nearest U.S. Coast Guard Coordination Center. Here on page 33, it shows you what you need to do to report the emergency to the Coast Guard. I'll let you guys go over this one. Standard maritime distress signals on page 34. I'll let you guys kind of review those. Um, there's several different ways that uh, sig uh, signal a distress. Uh, searching in the snow. When people become lost, the environment in which they find themselves is often a critical factor in their survival. The weather along with poor decision making often causes problems for both the searchers and the subject. Some of the most demanding SAR environments are those in which snow is a factor. Uh, snow can be challenging. Obviously it's going to be harder to walk in the snow. It's going to be cold. Among many of the considerations uh, for preparing a snow search is proper clothing, additional gear, terrain, and specialized teams and trainings. As with dealing with any challenges of search and rescue situations, be careful to keep yourself safe and know when to stop and ask for help before you're in over your head. Big bold letters here. Do not become an additional subject. If you feel like you are not comfortable or you might get lost or you're getting too cold, stop and um, ask for help. We don't want to make more victims couple of quick words about avalanche rescue. Avalanches are one of nature's most powerful events and can cause a great deal of damage and loss of life. Avalanches occur when three variables combine, snowpack, terrain, and weather. Each of these aspects is important, but avalanches are not hazardous without the addition of property or people. Avalanche rescue is conducted only by trained and qualified personnel and never by scouts. It's just too high of a risk uh, for somebody without the training to become uh, an additional subject. I'm gonna let you guys Go ahead and run over practice scenario two on your own. All right, we're gonna move on to being prepared. Since you guys are taking a first aid merit badge this week or have already taken it, I'm not gonna go over the first aid. If you guys have any questions about that, refer to the first aid video. Before searchers go into the field, some thought must be given to their and their fellow team members' personal safety. It does the subject no good if the search is delayed because a team member gets injured. Staying found. So for more than a century, scouting has, scouting has taught young people and adults the skills needed to safely enjoy the outdoors. Scouts who read the Boy Scout handbook and field book and practice good hiking and camping principles will become proficient outdoorsmen. As you progress in the earning of this merit badge, you will learn more about the skills that are important for search and rescue. Uh, but here is some uh, points here for keeping you from becoming a subject of search and rescue. Always have a trip plan and share it with your parents. Stick to your trip plan, know what the weather is like where you are going and be aware of how quickly the weather can change. Never hike or camp alone. Go with your patrol or troop. Use the buddy system. Have proper gear and clothing. Log into the trailhead log sheets if they're available. And get and stay in top physical condition. Be prepared for the level of activity planned. This is one where people get in a lot of trouble. They're, uh, that's why Philmont has so many rules about physical fitness for all of their trails because people will get hiked out and they're miles away from the road and they become um, they overexert themselves or they become um, too tired or unable to complete the hike. That's a big one. Just as we talk about in scouts a lot, you know, a scout takes care of themselves and stays active and stays in shape. Uh, the buddy system is a way for scouts to look after one another, especially during outdoor adventures. You keep track of your buddy and he keeps track of you. The buddy system should always be used when a trooper patrol is hiking, camping, and participating in any aquatic activities. The chances of a scout becoming lost decrease when the use of the buddy system is encouraged. After you discover how search and rescue missions for lost people are reported in your area, discuss the procedure with your parents. Post the phone number of the local agency responsible for search and rescue along with other emergency telephone numbers. Alright, uh, starting on page 41 is the first aid. Uh, this is all stuff that was discussed in a first aid merit badge, so we're going to skip through this. And you guys can go over the gear on your own. This is standard gear that you guys should have all these lists in your scout book. Um, this is stuff that you guys probably use when you're preparing for a campsite or a camp out. We're not gonna go over them today. Practice scenario three, I'll let you guys read through that. That's a pretty simple uh, practice scenario there. Interview and investigation, starting on page 49. When a person is believed to be missing, it is considered an emergency and someone must report it to the proper authorities. That person is called the reporting party and the lost person is called the subject of the search. Gathering as much information as possible, as soon as possible about the subject is important for a successful search. 
So to fulfill our requirement four for our merit badge, you need to find out which agency in your area has the jurisdiction and responsibility for search and rescue. This is something that you guys will have to turn in. We have scouts all over the country and we're blessed to have you guys. There's gonna be a lot of different agencies, which agency in your area has the jurisdiction and responsibility for search and rescue. A lot of times it's the sheriff's department, a lot of times it's uh, specific search and rescue teams, depending on like if you're close to national parks, there's a lot of teams around usually because there's a lot of search and rescue missions. So figure out what it is for your area, type that up. At the end of the videos here, I'm going to go over exactly what you need to turn into me. So keep track as we go along, but I'll also review it again. A lot of these that are demonstrate the knowledge to stay found and prevent yourself be for becoming a subject of search and rescue mission is just going to be you listening to me, paying attention obviously, um, and learning that. I'm not going to make you type up all these explanations because it would just be tedious and kind of pointless. Interviewing. After a person is reported missing, a police officer or other trained investigator interviews the reporting party and any witnesses. This is important to be done as carefully as possible. Again, we just need to get all the information that we can as soon as possible. The basic information is uh, the name of the subject, address and phone number, age and date of birth, height and weight. Physical description, including distinguishing marks, say, you know, if somebody's describing me, they're just going to say I'm tall, I'm 6'3", so stocky, red beard, uh, if you guys can see it, maybe uh, I have a couple of tattoos, maybe somebody can use that as a descriptor, wears glasses or contact, and whether or not they've been left behind, and type, style, and color of all clothing a subject was wearing when last seen. My name is Greg Muller, um, they would have my address and phone number, age and date of birth, height and weight, and I'm wearing a green shirt, blue jeans, and boots. The subject left his or her pack or an article of clothing behind. It might be used as a scent item for a canine search. We'll discuss that later with the specialized SAR teams. And finally, what the plans were. If you're hiking or camping, you should have a plan in place and have two, at least two copies, I think is what we recommend for different people, two or three. And that's going to help with last place seen or last known point. I'm at cabin A and I'm hiking to cabin B, and so they know to look along that route. Uh, the search manager, that's the incident commander, is then appointed and teams are activated. Having a photograph of the subject can really help in this search. For the backcountry stuff that I've done, I make my hike plan, my camping plan, where I'm going to be, at what time, when, and it's always a good idea to, you know, leave an actual physical photo with them. I know everybody's got cell phones now or can find pictures of people on social media, but it's still a good idea. It's going to save a lot of time if you already have a photo that they can make copies of right away. Evaluating search urgency. So we need to know how quickly or how dangerous the uh, situation that the person that's lost might be in. Um, weather's going to be a big factor there. Occasionally during a high adventure, backcountry experience, an entire group can go missing. Hikers may have made a wrong turn at a trail intersection or failed to consult their map. If they have their gear, food, and water with them and the weather conditions are favorable, the group may be considered overdue rather than missing. They very well might self-evacuate and get back on their planned itinerary. Searching for a group would not hold a very high urgency. On the other hand, a missing young child or elderly person is an urgent situation. So this is pretty um, common sense stuff. You know, if somebody's, uh, if you think they might be injured, if they're really young, really old, they're, um, you know, in the snow we talked about is a, a more urgent case. The lost person profiles, by analyzing the behavior of previous lost people, it may be possible to, quote, predict what subjects in similar situations might do, where they might go, and where they might be. This helps uh, as you complete your incident action plan and work on your clue awareness and tracking. The analysis of thousands of SAR reports has found that people of certain ages with certain interests have some of the same reactions of being lost. So children one to three years, they may be unaware of the concept of being lost. Their navigational skills and sense of direction are almost always non-existent and they tend to wander aimlessly. They tend not to respond to calls or whistles. These children often seek out a place to lay down and go to sleep. This could be under thick brush, an overhanging rock, or a picnic table, inside a car trunk, camper, or building, or curled up with a pet. Other places to look are nearby bodies of water. Young children are difficult to detect and rarely walk out by themselves. Children ages four to six uh, have developed the concept of being lost and will attempt to return home or go to a familiar place. They may panic and become further lost as they attempt to, quote, find themselves. They are more mobile than a one to three year old and may also use tracks, trails, or shortcuts that do not readily appear well defined to an adult. So like lower animal trails that maybe somebody that's taller might not see, somebody that's four to six can see them, they might use those. They sometimes become lost when they follow an animal or a group of older children. Children of this age are often found in the same places as children one to three. Children ages seven to 12, uh, while children in this age group have a more developed navigation and directional skills than the one to six year olds, the mental maps they may have constructed of their environments might be highly inaccurate and they frequently become lost while attempting a shortcut to a familiar location. To find children this age, check with friends about tracks, trails, shortcuts, that kind of thing. Youth ages 13 to 15, 
This is the age of many scouts, BSI, BSA, high adventure participants at national and council bases. Those in this group have more highly developed navigation and directional skills than the 7 to 12 year olds and frequently become lost in groups while engaged in exploring or in outdoor activity. They rarely travel far in a group and will usually respond to calls and whistles. Some may try direction sampling as they look at a familiar place. While they would attempt to find themselves, they often lack adult tactics and may panic and resort to irrational tactics. Places to search for this group include tracks, trails, and shortcuts. Check with friends about any secret or favorite places, hideouts, or routes. Also be sure to search landmarks, high points, and water features. Uh, using the buddy system whenever you are enjoying outdoor activities like hiking makes it less likely that you will get lost because you keep track of each other. So the trained search and rescue managers are aware of the differences here and might use that in their incident action plan to help, uh, you know, vitalize resources in the correct area. So I'll let you guys go over practice scenario four on your own. Uh, we're going to move on to orientation and navigation. I'm going to take a quick break here and we'll start back up at page 57.